Chapter 1 When crisis comes calling, it comes in the company of disruption. Toru Okada was married and out of his job at a law firm he had worked for since graduating from college. The job was not bad for his subsistence, but he just had an urge to craft some other course for his life. He could afford to be relaxed while hunting for a more promising prospect because his wife, Kumiko Okada, had a well-paying job as a magazine editor and freelance illustrator. A few weeks went by and a couple of petty skirmishes occurred between the Okada couple. On one of those idle days, Toru was home doing chores when he received an anonymous and strange call from a woman. The call essentially had a sexual undertone. In a bid to occupy his mind, Toro decided to search for their incommunicado household cat in a deserted alley in his neighborhood, but was unsuccessful. After the cat's disappearance, Kumiko also left home without any hint. However, Toru found it difficult to reconcile all that had happened to him of late. Toru Okada began a journey to find his wife, but veered off onto a tangent that led him to discover who Mr. Honda really was before becoming a clairvoyant. Lieutenant Mamiya gave Toru an in-depth narration of what could pass as Mr. Honda's biography. While reliving Japan's loss of the battle at Nomonan, Lieutenant Mamiya, a mutual acquaintance of Mr. Honda, a World War II veteran, sparked Toru's interest in educating himself in Japan's World War II history. In the meantime, Toru met some quite curious people with strange coincidences connecting them. For example, the father of Nutmeg Akaska, who was one of these people, had the same strange mark on his cheek as Toru. We also learn that various people who have heard the mysterious wind-up bird's cry have come to unhappy ends. Mystery is the most common precursor of inquisition. Don't want people nosing around? Avoid secrecy as much as possible. The reverse is also the case. It would be natural to crave the knowledge of how it all ended, whether Toru Akata found his cat and wife, so come along on an unraveling journey as we demystify the wind-up bird in this captivating piece. Chapter 2 How a Sweet Union Went Soggy Toru and Kumiko Okada had been married for just six years. Having been freshly out of his job, Toru had all the time in the world to contemplate the trajectory of his life. Besides his career, Toru proceeded to give his relationship with Kumiko a mental shakedown. Up until then, everything about Toru's life seemed normal, of course, except for the anonymous woman who occasionally phoned, asking for ten minutes of his time. The woman was Malta Kano. With a nudge from Kumiko, Toru agreed to meet Malta Kano, who turned out to be a psychic. Malta Kano told Toru about a certain sister, Krita, who was allegedly raped by Noboru Wataya, Toru's brother-in-law. Malta Kano went further to predict that Toru's life would take a new turn. She cited the disappearance of his cat as a milestone marking the genesis of this prophecy. Concrete things capture one's attention, but they are often little more than trivia. Sideshows. The more one tries to see into the distance, the more generalized things become. Kumiko's family, the Watayas, had a thing for mediums and clairvoyants. The whole Malta Kano escapade had brought fresh memories of Mr. Honda to Toru's memory. Mr. Honda was a practitioner of spirit possession whom Kumiko's father had required the couple to meet before they got married. After his first encounter with Malta Kano, Toru realized that both Mr. Honda and Malta Kano had spoken to him about water, and Mr. Honda had warned him to be careful. Malta Kano had undergone austerities while staying on the island of Malta, the origin of her adopted first name, connected with her water research. Perhaps it was a coincidence, but both had expressed serious concerns about water, which suddenly became a source of concern for Toru. Chapter 3 Mei Kashihara and Krita Kanu The Tale 
There was a small stand of trees close to the Okada residence, and from it could be heard the mechanical cry of a bird that sounded as if it were winding a spring. The couple would come to call this bird the wind-up bird, the name given by Kumiko, and even though they never saw it, they were quite familiar with its occasional cries. While trying to find their lost cat in the neighborhood, Toro began an acquaintanceship with a teenage girl, Mei Kasahara, who lived close to some of the vacant properties in the area. For a 16-year-old teenager, Toro found Kasahara to be a toxic pessimist who had a way of relating everything possible to death. While inquiring about the scar Kasahara had on her face and the limp in her gait, he learned she had been in a motorcycle accident. She would later tell Toru that her limp was a front, a pretense she had been pulling even after healing. A person's acquaintances and inner circle at a particular time are often a reflection of their emotional status and inner being. A near-death experience occurred when Kasahara left Toru in a deep and dry well on the abandoned property where they often met. Toru had gone down the well to reflect on the downward plunge of his life after Kumiko left him. Kasahara would later apologize to Toru, who escaped mysteriously with the assistance of Krita Kano. The first time Toru met Krita Kano was at his home. She had come on the prompt of her sister Malta, and the visit bordered on collecting water samples from the Okada's home. During this visit, Krita offered Toru an extensive chronicle of her life. However, the second encounter of Toru and Krita would be in a dream, and a quite vivid one at that. They had sex in Toru's dream on two different occasions. The intriguing thing was that Krita described what the experience, sex with Toru, felt like on their subsequent meeting. This awareness of what happened in his dream left Toru in much confusion. He had difficulty fixing his sexual encounter with Krita between mere hallucination and physical reality. Did you know? According to the L.A. Intelligence Detective Agency, 74% of men and 68% of women admit they'd cheat if it were guaranteed they'd never get caught. Chapter 4 A Detailed Account of Kumiko's Departure Mr. Honda, the old clairvoyant of the Okadas, passed away as the episode of Toru's life was unfolding. While visiting to deliver Mr. Honda's keepsake, Lieutenant Mamiya told Toru of the time he and Mr. Honda spent together at the fronts during World War II. It was a fairly long story. The keepsake that Mr. Honda left was in a box, and Toru was instructed by the lieutenant to open it only after he was dead. After Lieutenant Mamiya's departure, Toru found the keepsake to be an empty box, leaving him quite astonished. Wars change the dimensions of nations. They also alter the life and livelihood of people and even animals. On the day Kumiku deserted home, it was without warning. That morning, while zipping his wife's dress, Toru noticed she was wearing a new perfume. He asked about the cologne, innocently, complimentary, in fact. But Kumiko left home without responding, in the guise of haste. Toru stayed up most of that night, awaiting Kumiko's arrival, till he fell asleep. But she didn't show up or call. The following morning, slightly before noon, Toru called her office and learned she did not turn up that day. After that, she never did. This he confirmed by asking Kasahara to call Kumiko's office several days afterward. Results aside, the ability to have complete faith in another human is one of the finest qualities a person can possess. Haruki Marakami Toru later found the cologne case, Christian Dior, with a ribbon around it. It had been a gift, most likely from a man. Interestingly, Kumiku had taken none of her personal effects when taking off on that fateful day, not a shoe nor a change of clothing. However, Toru would later find out that she picked up a pair of clothing he had earlier dropped at the laundromat on her last morning at work. While Toru remained at home awaiting a call concerning Kumiko's whereabouts, he received a call from Malta inviting him to a meeting with Kumiko and Noboru Wataya. When the trio eventually met at the Shinagawa Pacific Hotel, Noboru Wataya claimed that his sister, 
Kumiko, had requested an official dissolution of her marriage to Toru. Chapter 5 Toru's Decline into Oblivion and Krita Kanu's Liberation Toro took one of Mr. Honda's counsel when he went down the deep, dark, and dry well on the abandoned property close to his residence. In the solitude and darkness of the dry well, Toru reflected on his journey through life. He tried to lay his fingers on the moment when things started falling apart between himself and Kumiko and pegged it on the day that she had gone for an abortion. When you're supposed to go up, find the highest tower and climb to the top, when you're supposed to go down, find the deepest well and go down to the bottom. Corporal Oishi Honda Toro left home with a backpack, got to the dry well, and let himself down the deep well using a long rope ladder that he harnessed to a nearby tree. He had gone down the well with only a bottle of water, and soon pangs of hunger hit him. Toru would have gone out of the well the same way he went in, but Kasahara, who lives close by and initially showed him the well, taunted him by pulling up the rope ladder when he passed out. Kasahara would have left Toru for dead in her fatal game, but Krita miraculously saved him by waking him and letting down the rope ladder. When Toru got out of the well, Krita was not in sight, so he proceeded home, satiated his hunger of three days, washed up and rested. Not long after, Malto called the house asking if Toru had seen her sister. Toru rushed back to the well and found Krita in the well. Krita told Toru not to worry as she was taking time to think just as he had. Isolation aids concentration and mental empowerment that enables emotional liberation and a better grasp of reality. Toru returned home and came back to the well in the morning, only to find it empty. He also noticed something strange while shaving his grown beard, a bluish-black mark on his right cheek, the same cheek on which he felt warmth during one of his many disillusioned trances down in the well. Interestingly, Malta had asked him during her previous call if there were any strange changes to his body. Chapter 6 Transformative Times That Charted a New Course Toru remembered he had not checked the mailbox since he returned from his hiatus down the dry well, and when he did, there was an envelope with an inscription in the handwriting of Kumiko. Kumiko tried her best to explain her motive for leaving, her guilt of cheating on him, how she felt about the abortion she had some years back, and a bit of advice that Toru should not bother looking for her. A predictably peaceful future can be easily transformed by a wrong turn on the track of life. He went to bed that night, disoriented, and woke up the next morning to discover a naked woman on Kumiko's side of the bed. It was Krita. She completed the story she was telling Toru about herself from the first time they physically met. Krita spent some days with Toru, wore Kumiko's clothes, cooked for him, and they even made love, a reenactment of their sexual encounter in the dream. Krita suggested that Toru come with her to Crete, as she has always longed to visit the island. He turned down the offer after confiding in his uncle, Mr. Saruta. Months went by, and Toru's life remained in an emotional limbo. At a point, Kumiko's family members began contacting Toru to ensure he agreed to proceed with the divorce, but he would not budge. He insisted on seeing Kumiko before following through with the divorce. These persuasions graduated into threats, and Toru's life continued with this trend for the next year. About this time, Toru visited Hanging House property via the alley and found it had been demolished, with Kasahara nowhere in sight. Toru called his uncle to say hello and asked for the contact address of the estate agent in charge of a handful of properties in the Setagaya residential neighborhood. Upon paying a visit to Mr. Ichikawa, the realtor, Toru asked the fate of the property that once housed the Mayawaki family. Ichikawa explained that a foreign investment company had bought the property to resell it at a profit. However, because most potential buyers were aware of the evil history of the property, no one was showing interest. Chapter 7 Coming Up for Air A New Chance at Life 
Mr. Ichikawa informed Toru of the potential asking price of the property to be about 80 million yen, judging by the fact that no one was showing interest in buying. Another issue that arose during Toru's conversation with his uncle was a need to reclaim his life by paying attention to the simple things. Considering his uncle's advice, Toru realized he had no meaningful interactions with people, particularly since Kasahara's family had moved away from the neighborhood. Hence, he began taking walks away from the house. First, he limited his adventures to the vicinity of the Setagaya residential area, and later on, he would take train rides to Shinjuku Station, where he loitered. It was at Shinjuku Station that Nutmeg Akasaka first noticed Toru, and their acquaintanceship began. Of course, the woman's real name was not Nutmeg, neither was her son's actual name, Cinnamon. The value of life is a function of what we make of the fodders it avails us, good or bad. Toru's serendipitous meeting with Nutmeg Akasaka and her son Cinnamon was caused by the unusual attraction that she felt to the mark on Toru's right cheek. Nutmeg later revealed that her father had a similar mark as Toru's. Being a professional fashion designer and a wealthy woman with high taste, Nutmeg gave Toru's persona a complete makeover. Before long, he was rendering what they called fitting services for rich, middle-aged women. Spend your money on the things money can buy. Spend your time on the things money can't buy. Haruki Marakami Nutmeg and Cinnamon bought the abandoned property, built a small and exquisite structure on it, and dug the well even deeper despite its remaining dryness. It was even fitted with a steel ladder. Toru always went to the refurbished hanging house property clandestinely through the back alley of his house. Only Cinnamon accessed the property through its remote-controlled gate. He would come in a Mercedes-Benz 500 SEL with tinted glass conveying the female guests in need of fitting via the same means, so the neighbors knew nothing about the new owner or what transpired within the now high walls. Toru would spend nights in the well and days in the new house and occasionally return to his residence. Chapter 8 the Equilibria of Imagination and Reality Through Mr. Ushikawa, a mole, Noboru Wataya later learned that Toru was the new owner of the hanging house. Noboru Wataya, therefore, proceeded to bargain that Toru sell the property in return for an opportunity to communicate with Kumiko, all in a bid to protect his political reputation. Noboru Wataya offered to buy the hanging house property by paying off the 80 million yen mortgage. Mr. Ushikawa subsequently offered Toru a wager to chat virtually via a computer with Kumiko. Along the line, Nutmeg and Cinnamon were able to link Toru and Noboru Wataya to the speculative newspaper articles about the hanging house. They abruptly severed ties with Toru and the property. Initially, Toru deserted the property for some six days at a stretch. Then the damning feeling of solitude caused him to return on the sixth day. With a hunch that he would be losing the property soon, as he was out of the nutmeg and cinnamon Akaska fitting job, he ventured down the well one last time. There, Toru went into a trance and found himself in the same room he had found himself on previous visits to the well. The imagination of a man wields the weapon that results in the manifestation of physical tangibility. In the room that Toro visited in his trance, he encountered a woman who spoke with many voices, one of which was Kumiko's. Strangely enough, another figure entered the room and attacked Toru with a knife, inflicting several cuts on him, notably on his left shoulder and right cheek. In response to the assault, Toru fought back during the trance, wielding a baseball bat and eventually subdued the assailant by splitting open his skull. Toru regained consciousness at the bottom of the dry well to find that it now contained water. He also realized that he still had the wounds and pains he acquired in the trance. Before long, the water in the well started rising, and Toru would have drowned if he had not been saved at the last minute by Cinnamon Akaska. Conclusion 
Toru Okada may, at the onset, have thought that his problem was due to the fact that he quit his job without any concrete assurance of a better one. His premarital encounter with Mr. Honda proved Toro to be a skeptic of the extra-normal. Something similar to the defilement which Krita Kanu reports to have experienced in the hands of Noboru Wataya was the cause of Kamiko's problems. The extramarital affairs which Kamiko Akata had before leaving her husband were obviously beyond her control. Interestingly, that turned out to be the case with Kamiko's sister, who passed away at a young age. After departure from the Setagaya neighborhood, Mei Kasahara turned out to have developed a strong bond with Mr. Windup Bird, Toru. The relationship of Toru Akata and Credo Kano eventually became a distant one, though she later settled in Japan, contrary to her initial yearning to relocate to Crete. Toro's trances in the well, the mark on his right cheek, and all the strange coincidental experiences worked synergistically to take him to his wife, Kamiko. Though he didn't realize this till the very end of the entire episode, Toru had allowed his instincts to guide him through the necessary course to liberate Kamiko from the sinister grasp of her brother, Noboru Wataya. The story's conclusion seems a pointless one, but at least Toru could retain his life and sanity. Memories and thoughts age just as people do, but certain thoughts can never age and certain memories can never fade. Haruki Marakami Toru Okada was the only person who heard the sinister cries of the wind-up bird. In addition to never seeing the bird's physical form, the story has it that people who hear its song come to an evil end. Thus, the bird in itself likely symbolizes the peculiar challenges each man faces and the exclusivity accompanying some of them. Try this. Access the status of your relationship with the loved ones you have around. Appreciate them for who they are and try to understand them at a level that would dispel the interference of third parties.